welcome. My name is Bella Desai, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Exhibition Education here at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome you all here this evening. Um, I'd actually love to ask you to um, all move in a little bit to the center, of the, uh, the center of your rows, if you can, towards the middle of the theater, only because we will have additional folks coming in, and that'll avoid having them crawl over you to get to a seat. So um, we appreciate that if you're able to do that. Thank you. Um, so as I hope all of you know, we have a really wonderful new exhibition here at the museum called Our Global Kitchen. Food, Nature, Culture. How many of you out there have actually been to this exhibition already? Fantastic. And for the rest of you, I hope you do have a chance to go and check it out because it really is an amazing broad brush view of food from farm to fork. Um, in conjunction with the exhibition, we have the opportunity to really do a lot of exciting, dynamic programs. And uh, tonight is one of the programs that I've been most looking forward to. We've been planning this for almost a year now. Um, and the reason I'm so excited about it is because when we, way back when, when we were just thinking about this exhibition, when it was just a twinkle in the curator's eyes, we did a survey to the public trying to find out what kinds of topics people would be interested in related to food. And the number one topic far and away was the issue of hunger and what kinds of solutions could be brought to bear on the issue of hunger that we know is so prevalent throughout the world and right here at home. Um, so we know that this is something that people want to know about. Um, also, there's a lot of great myth-busting to be done about the issue of hunger and about food security because a lot of these stereotypical images we have about issues of hunger are totally misleading. And this, these notions of there not being enough food, there being too many people, um, I'm gonna let the panelists really do this, but there are some really interesting innovative strategies coming up and a lot of these old notions are really not true anymore. Um, and then of course, uh, as I mentioned the panelists, one of the most exciting things about tonight is the ability to have these amazing luminaries from such a wide variety of fields here tonight together to speak about this issue of food security from a variety of different perspectives. Um, so just quickly, the format of the event, um, it's, a, it's gonna be an informal moderated roundtable conversation. Um, that'll go for about 45 or 50 minutes. Um, and then around eight o'clock, we'll switch to an, a Q&A um, and take questions from the audience. Because there are so many of you and because we're sure there are lots of questions, we're actually asking you to take questions, write your questions on the cards that were given to you when you came in. Um, and we have folks that can hand out cards as well. So if you didn't get a card, raise your hand. We'll make sure we get one to you. Um, and about um, 20 minutes to eight, a quarter to eight, 20 minutes to eight, we'll have volunteers in the aisles collect those questions on the cards. We'll pass them up to um, Bob Bazell, who's our moderator, and he'll go ahead and ask some of your questions. And then we'll finish um, pretty much promptly at 8.30. So um, the, uh, our moderator tonight, as I mentioned, is Robert Bazell. Um, he's NBC News Chief Health and Science Correspondent. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of California at Berkeley with a BA in biochemistry. He did graduate work in biology at the University of Sussex, Sussex in England and was awarded a doctoral degree in immunology at the University of California at Berkeley. He is both a scholar and a passionate communicator of science, which is why we feel so lucky to have him here to um, moderate this conversation. <coughs> During his career, Bazell has reported on a wide range of subjects in the areas of science, technology, and medicine from throughout the United States and around the world. His followers have long known that when there is a major breakthrough in science or health, Bazell will be there to explain it in a lively and understandable way. When he was awarded the prestigious George Foster Peabody Award, for distinguished achievement and meritorious service in broadcasting. The citation said that Bazell's work exemplified the best reporting on science and medicine. From transmission of the AIDS virus to innovations in cancer treatment, from the perceived dangers of cellular phones to alternative modes of healthcare, Bazell brings intelligence, understanding, and reportorial excellence to the task. Bazell is an, ex an outstanding television reporter who recognizes when to speak, when to listen, and when to tell. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Bazell. Wow, look at how many of you are here. This is wonderful. Uh, 
Thank you, Bevel, for that really kind introduction. And I, w I want to thank all of you for, for coming here tonight. A, for coming, because I think this is really, we have a great panel, but B, for your support of this museum. Because in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, this is not only one of the best institutions in New York City, it's one of the best in the United States and in the entire world, and your support is very much appreciated. So let's get on to, to the panel about this, this, this critical is issue of food and hunger in the world, which we all care so much about. Our, our first panelist, Raj Patel, please come out, Raj. Raj uh, is an academic and a, uh, who has written extensively and lectured extensively on the subject of sustainability, food, and, and the dynamics of, of food in the world. He's currently at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's also spent a lot of time in, in South African universities. He is uh, working currently on a documentary, which to give you an idea of the scope of how he looks at problems, which is being filmed in Malawi, Peru, Detroit, and Delhi. So that. Uh, that, that gives, uh, and, and the interactions of those kind of things are, I, I hope we're going to talk about. Our next panelist is Molly John. Molly, please come out. Molly has the amazing distinction of being the creator of 60 plants, 60 vegetables, uh, which were, uh, she's a, now a, a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She, previously, she was at Cornell. She is a, a great academic with an enormous interest in all in, in sustainability and in the systems of food production in the world and, and how we things make, make their way from wherever they're grown to the, the plates of people all around the world. <coughs> and our third panelist is Marcus Samuelson. Marcus, are you here? Have you come? Yeah. Marcus? <laughs> <laughs> he was here. Here comes Marcus. Mar well, I'll tell you about Marcus while he's making his way out. <laughs> Marcus Samuelson was born in Ethiopia. He died, uh, when he was three years old, his parents died of tuberculosis, which is a disease which may come, come up tonight in our discussions about the world's food situation. And he was ra uh, raised by p p people of Swedish descent. He trained extensively as a chef in Europe. He uh, then became the executive chef at the the age of 24, he won three stars at the New York Times for being executive when he was executive chef at uh, Aquavit. He then moved on to start his own restaurant called the Red Rooster in Harlem. He was the chef for the first White House dinner in the Obama administration. He recently had a dinner for a fundraiser for the second Obama campaign. So, welcome, Marcus. Sanders. Thank you. And so I'm going to start out by uh, asking all of you, and anybody can take this question, and I want the, these people to. Uh, speak among themselves. But because I'm a TV reporter, I'm gonna, this is about me. See, so I'm gonna, sorry, the first question is about me. But in the 1990s, I covered the, there was a famine in Somalia, and it followed what has become a fairly familiar pattern. We went in our TV crews and, and took pictures of dying children. It got the world's attention. We quickly discovered uh, all the journalists that the food, there was plenty of shortage of food in the, in the country. The food was in warehouses and city, and it was actually a political situation. Bill Clinton sent in the troops. The result was Black Hawk Down, the, the horrible situation. We, threw, we pulled out our troops and just kind of abandoned the thing. So anybody who wants to take that first, uh, what does that tell us about what's going on with food in the world? Well, I, I mean, to, to me, what that suggests is that hunger is a political problem, uh, because we, we produce more food Per, more calories per person than ever before in human history. And that's one of the myths around hunger, is that, that often when we think of hunger, it's narrated as, well, there's, there's just not enough food in the world, and that's why people are going hungry. Well, that's wrong, um, as, as you saw. And as we know from every major famine, every major famine since the Second World War, there's been food in the region when people have starved to death. The reason that people have starved is not because of a shortage of food, but because they were poor, and the, way that, the only way they, they could access food was with money that they didn't have. So I, I think that the, the, what I'm hearing from that story is uh, that, that food and hunger is always political. Molly? Um, I think it's, it, it, is, it underscores a very important observation for the scientific community, which has focused on yield. Yield, yield. In fact, when I was in graduate school, that's what I was taught. Yield, 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 Molly. That's all you need to know. And in fact, um, I am excited to see a flip in orientation, although it is a tr it's transitioning, it's not complete, towards outcomes in human dimensions. In other words, how are the people doing? How are the people doing? 
It's, and it's not just about how much food we have, it's what quality. It's about nutritional security and nutritional health. When there's a failure like that, it's a systemic failure. It's a complicated failure. And, um, and it's a failure of the utmost moral as well as political, economic um, um, importance. So it, it's a very um, significant observation that we've excused ourselves from in some very important areas. Marcus, did you want to say one? Yeah, um, I, I think um, we, we have to start learning looking at on, on the world of foods, not just from a Western monocle. When I'm in Ethiopia, I learn so much about food, and always when I leave, people ask me, do they even have food in Ethiopia? Uh, when I'm in Ethiopia, uh, people ask me, what do they eat in America? So that just tells me that both sides have so little information in the most about each other truly, although there's this time where we, we can have more information, we're more connected than ever, but we're also further away. So I think that um, in, in places like Ethiopia and Somalia, eating with a spiritual compass is something that they've done for generations and it's something that we are still getting at in this country. We have food cuts in, in this country that I would say are greater than the ones in Ethiopia and Somalia. And it, it's, it's challenging because we have obviously all the access and the money and the information to fix it. Uh, and, and there you might say we don't have the infrastructure to fix it. So who's really better off? It's, it's, uh, it's always a question that I'm left with. Well, that leads me to something else that is a personal thing. And I'm not going to make everything start with a personal story. But one of the things that I did when I was covering the origins of the disease that came to be known as AIDS, I visited a lot of places in, in Africa as well as Haiti, and I'm just focusing on Haiti. When I first got to Haiti in 1982, there were a lot of hungry people, of course, but there were no obese people. And I, when I went back recently after the earthquake, there are enormous numbers of very poor, obese people, especially women. Tell me why that is. Well, I mean, what, what we've seen with the, the, the liberalization of economic markets and with the, 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 the market, the extension of marketing of the, the, what passes for the Western diet uh, into, uh, into countries you know, south of, of the United States is an increase in levels of overweight and obesity and then the, 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 the sort of attendant health uh, effects. Uh, you know, we, we can see this, for example, in Mexico with the, the, the passage of NAFTA um, there's been a lot of research showing how NAFTA in, in, in resulted in increased obesity. And you know, there's a sort of strange curve in Mexico. Well, but in, the, in, in one of the books you wrote, yeah. you, you, you noticed you made the notation that because there was an enormous amount of corn being imported suddenly on the market in a country that grows, grew corn traditionally, but the price of tortillas went up. Why, why did that happen? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated story, but, but it, essentially what, what you have is uh, U.S. corn dis, you know, destroying the, 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 local, the local market, uh, and then people needing to actually pay for corn because their the, the ability to, to grow, you know, to, be able, to be able to afford uh, the, 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 what used to be their staple was taken away from them. Uh, and so you, you end up with a sort of a, par a paradoxical situation where um, the, the corn's coming in, you have just a couple of co companies that control the market, and of course they, they ratchet up the price. And people's ability to access that corn is taken away because their income from farming has disappeared. So you end up with what, what were called t tortilla riots in, in the, uh, the, the mid-2000s. But, uh, Marcus, why are there so many obese poor people outside the United States? Because the explanation sure. we often get in the United States is, well, they, they have... A, their access is, there, is to fast food chains, or, and there's, there's food deserts where you can't buy vegetables in, in poor neighborhoods. But why are there now the, nowadays fat people in very poor countries? Well, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a big general session, but I do think <coughs> in countries like Egypt and Mexico, for example, I think a little bit uh, the economy switch it, right? The aspirations very often in, in, in um, these countries is very often to eat American uh, fast food. So the aspirations are switched, right? Fast food is the, thing, is the place to hang out, is more the place of social, especially for teenagers, and uh, they've also gone 
So I think there you see much more the obesity in upper class, because that before, if 80, 90 percent were farmers and working uh, with their bodies, there a middle class to upper middle class family has uh, very often two or three people working in the house and then not necessarily working out, and then their aspiration is to go to fast food. So it's almost like they pick the worst type of thing from Western culture <laughs> without applying, uh, you know, uh, enough, you know, running around and health around that. So I think that it's, it's a, you know, America and Western and, and, and fast food represent a completely different thing if you go to the Middle East uh, and, 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 and places like that than it does here. It, it, it just is completely different yeah. things. But just, uh, just to pick up on, I mean, we know that food is, is one, of the, uh, it's one of the things that ties us together, but it's also one of the most complex things. For example, uh, in, in Senegal, for example, if you go the coastal line right, right outside Dakar, where uh, the local fishermen used to just go outside, every, you go out, fish every day, get their fa 20 fish, take five for their family, and sell the rest on the market, when they sold the 15 fish, they were done for the day. Now there is no local fish for that fisherman because you have very much the demand of sushi and Japanese boats and Russian boats. So all those fishes are gone. So the local fishing is gone uh, very much in, in Senegal. So what happens is that that then turns into a immigration issue in Spain mm -hmm. instead into the EU, where in the same fisher boats or fishermen boats are very simple. Uh, you know, tons of Senegalese fishermen trying to go from Senegal to Spain, and you have thousands of thousands of Senegalese fishermen dying every year, right? So when we're applying our, our uh, middle-class Western values to the rest of the world, it has an impact, and then we all very often just there reporting on, why is it? Why are people fighting? Well, we have to think about it a little bit. And I think that is the challenge we have as the most educated and most country with most access is in a, in, in, in a global world with seven, uh, north of 7 billion people, with 80 million people added to every, every year to the world, that enormous amount of people want to do what we do here. How can we then do that responsibly? What are our responsibilities towards well, you're, that? You're asking questions. Why, Molly, why don't you jump in? <laughs> well, I think <laughs> it's some really, answers. really <laughs> important to pull a theme out of this conversation, and that is to note the connection between industrializing food mm -hmm. systems, which is just what Marcus has described, and outcomes in human health. This is a classic pattern everywhere on Earth. It doesn't mean it's due to the same exact combination of factors, but there is, a, it, there is a classic connection between industrializing food systems and the rise of, of certain non-communicable diseases generally linked to obesity. So in this country, some statistics show this generation of children will be the first facing life expectancy shorter than ours. Um, so this is a pattern that we share globally. It's, it's dire everywhere it appears. All right, so the question though, that, and that's a really important point, and I think it gets to what I think the theme of this exhibit is and the theme of, this com can, uh, of our conference. Can we avoid industrializing food systems? I mean, can we feed all the six billion now, and nine billion in 30 years without an industrialized food system? But we're not feeding them now. I mean, that's, we're, we're, as I say, we have more calories than ever before and yet we have 850 million people who are malnourished. Uh, and in the United States, I mean, no one says that there's a, you know, we have the most industrialized food system on the planet, and we have 50 million people who are food insecure. Uh, we're not doing a great job here. Uh, so again, I mean, it seems to me that, that when, when one resorts to this sort of, what we need is more industrial agriculture and more, you know, you know more combine harvesters and, uh, you know, more genetically modified this, that, and the other. Um, it, that's to miss the, the very, I mean, the, the vital point that we're, we have a, a massive problem of distribution because of the way that, we, because hunger is a problem of poverty. It's not a problem uh, right off the bat of production, certainly well, in the United well, that, States. Well, that leads to something we should want to deal with right away, which is the Malthusian question, which is, is, is that always been a myth? Because in my lifetime, it's gone in cycles. You know, after the Second World War, obviously, so many people have been killed by both wars that people weren't thinking about population. And then Paul, Paul Ehrlich came along, wrote the book, The Population Bomb. It suddenly became a problem again. And, and, and then it 
when that went away, and now I see it's coming back again, and people are saying, oh, my goodness, the population, the world can't sustain this many people. What's the answer? Well, I think at least part of the answer is beautifully illustrated in this exhibit, which is that we are dealing with food systems. And to focus on any particular dynamic in that food system without the recognition of the linkages across scales is dangerous. And we've done that experiment lots of different ways all over the earth. If we, if we conceive of food systems that are efficient, that are equitable, that create health, um, we would likely get some different outcomes. But we haven't designed this food system to do those things. And so it's no surprise in some sense that it doesn't. Um, and so holding forward the, the commitments of, of equity, um, which turns out to be, um, even in the most sort of self-interested, narrow way, a matter of national security for this country with respect to any place on earth, um, these issues come front and center in this century. So it isn't that industrialized, there is such a thing as a single industrialized food system and it's evil. It's that there are all kinds of patterns and we have not necessarily targeted the outcomes we're understanding are critically important in this century. Okay, this is going to be a question that you didn't particularly, I want to point out to the audience, you didn't particularly want to answer. But, and, uh, but can people in the who live in New York City or any place else in the United States by eating locally grown food or asking for organic food or you know, being conscious about what they put in their mouth, can, can they affect the change that's going to matter in these globalized food systems yeah. we're talking about? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, we want, I mean, music, uh, food is not like a Gunjam style hit. You know, it's not <laughs> like a 10 million uh, hits on YouTube and, which, you know, and, and goes fast. And we want fast solution to something that takes time over uh, <laughs> generations. But I do think that we sit here with all this information and we can slowly affect. Uh, and we have to, because the other option is to go the other way and affect it in the wrong way. And that will quicker affect the environment, right? So uh, by thinking as a family and as a, a community of adding funding in NASA's Maybe eating uh, a vegetarian meal a week uh, will have an impact if 8 million people, and then or again, you take that through the United States and then you take it through the Western world. That has an impact. Thinking about the size of the protein and how often I eat protein, for example. You know, so, uh, you know, the, the food space is very crowded. There's signs all of the time with, uh, with it's, it's interesting because it's a space where you can come up with non-facts and make them uh, uh, relevant if you talk about it enough times. You go into a store like Whole Food, for example, there's signs up. And because you're in Whole Food, you're supposed to trust it. <laughs> and, and if you, there's signs up that are up there enough times, it doesn't mean they're right, it just means that you're still in Whole Food. <laughs> so so it's, it's very important to realize how, how like, and, and, and these things, you know, again, when I go back to my village where I come from in Ethiopia, the word uh, organic has very little value because it's all the food that is from that far farm to table has no, uh, have no value because everything is farm to table. So we pay a premium on things that should be normal. And, and that is, so we, we, we're starting off from the wrong <coughs> starting point and we sort of slowly sort of bring that back. And I think the most impactful way is that if each one person thinks about <coughs> What would it mean to eat with a spiritual compass? If we truly think about that, that means that we would know when to fast, that means we would know when to celebrate when we're breaking fast, and it means also we can learn things, like we do in other things, in, in science and other things, from other countries, not Europe, not other rich countries, actually things, countries from what we call the third world. And I think that would be fascinating, it would be a good lesson for us. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Talk, talk to each other. Well, because I, I, what I really like there is, is the idea of thinking as a community. Because often we're encouraged to just sort of shop our way to, yeah. to, to a better and brighter future. And I mean, that's a particularly sort of American myth that we can together change the world by shopping. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I think, you know, I mean, it's, it's, and of course, you know, I mean, I, I buy fair trade coffee because 
you know, the alternative is what? Bastard coffee, right? You know, blood on your beans. But you know, we shouldn't have that option. We shouldn't have the option of, you know, coffee that involves exploitation. As you say, you, we're paying a premium for something that's normal. I yeah. love that idea. But I also think it's important for us to think as a community, as you say, because if we're, if we're merely just trying to shop our way out of, out of a problem, we're not really addressing the structure of the problem. And I think that that's something... You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's important for us to think structurally and, mm -hmm. to think that, and to understand that the only way structures have ever changed is when we act as a community and, and take them on very directly. Yeah. One really important um, connection is between consumer dollars and producer livelihoods. Where, and producers come in, family farms can be a, from very small to very large. But um, one thing we really focus on in the Midwest and we focus on in, in developing countries is the recognition that those who produce the food deserve a livelihood that is sufficient for um, at least you know, the basic, ne basic needs of human beings. And that means education, it means safety. Um, so that is a really important um, way to make that linkage, but I think we've oversimplified. Um, I can tell you with a brother-in-law who is very grateful to, I'm sure some of you in particular in the audience, for shopping um, to buy his, his greens and my vegetables. <laughs> 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 um, your dollars go to a little farm in upstate New York that really needs them. Um, likewise, the linkages, and they're beautifully illustrated in the exhibit, between dollars in this country and elsewhere in this world, in the world, have a really important impact. But but it's really important not to oversimplify. Well, didn't Marcus make a very good point about Whole Foods? I mean, and I don't mean to pick on Whole no. Foods, and they may be, there may be some sorry, the audience from Whole Foods. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Whole Foods is great. Yeah, great. But, but this whole idea that a place can can charge a premium for food that may not how how do you know as a consumer? whether something is more healthy because it's called organic or it's sold in a certain store that may be more expensive than the, the supermarket where people who don't have the kind of money to go there. But even, even if it is organic, that's not the solution. And that's my point. Like, there's so much buzzwords out there. So, I mean, you know, there, there, are many more, there are many more factors. How did the food get, get from the store to here? Uh, what season is it in? And learning to long for things in season. And, you know, s simple things like that, like, that's what I want. I'd love to go to places like an island, like in Sicily, for example, right? They don't even care about Italy. They only care about Sicily. And so you only, you only eat what Sicily has. And that's great because it, it be, turns it very seasonal. And it also learned, teaches you to start longing for something. Like, and I remember growing up in Sweden, for example, rhubarb you can eat from June, basically June 15 to maybe somewhere in July, and then it was gone, right? So it's a six-week window, and rhubarb was everywhere. Well, let's celebrate it. And that is the type of, it goes a little bit against the grand art society here, which is now, now, now. <coughs> and so we have to, that's my point, is we have to look at other cultures. How are they doing? What can we learn from them? And how can we quickly, you know, if you can adapt Zumba, into an everyday exercise, <laughs> you can adapt to eat better. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, you know, you can. But it's very important as we, as we make these transitions back and forth across cultures, which can be so vibrant and mm -hmm. so exciting, and, and that, that um, we don't export, um, for example, pressure on biodiversity. And that's a, so that's a classic pattern. If we reduce our productivity in one place, we're probably increasing pressure elsewhere. So there are some fantastic studies from the scientific community that literally try to quantify the extent to which um, making choices that may make you feel good right now here, but put additional pressure, sure. particularly in vulnerable areas that still have biodiversity, you may not be having the desired effect. So again, it's about thinking about those connections and understanding linkages. Mm -hmm. Understanding. Can you give an example of that? Well, for example, um, I'll, I'll quote a good friend of mine who works in the UK who says, you know, we've already wrecked our biodiversity. I'm not saying I know that to be true, but, but this is what a colleague says. Why would we fail to take advantage, in a sense, of an agricultural situation we have created that's very productive? Um, reduce the productivity there and, and put extra pressure on vulnerable parts of the world by way of importing food. In other words, um, Cut down more rainforest, 
um, because we've elected to have more butterflies in our backyard to, to heighten the contrast. So again, I think just remembering that we can, our actions connect to each other. And it's not just our, our economic actions. Um, you know, if we elect to, to um, grab a magic bullet, speaking of Malthus, there may be implications um, down the road that we want to, that we would um, perhaps be advised to, to be paying more attention to, or elsewhere on Earth. The worst example, of course, everybody can agree, is Fiji water. Mm -hmm. I have never seen in my life anything so stupid. Mm -hmm. as, <laughs> as, or maybe it's brilliant, because first of all, the, the person that got the idea to sell bottled water to Americans, and the, if you want to know how to save lives in a medical sense, the, the biggest drug on earth that will save more lives than anything else is clean water. There's nothing close, not, even, not any fraction of, of close to that. So if somebody starts putting New York City water in bottles and selling it, that's brilliant for starters. I, you know, I wish I could put dirt in bottles and sell it and make a fortune, it would do very well. And then somebody else takes water from Fiji around the world, now that's, that's a really bad example. So that, that's right up there. But then how do you know with what you're saying, Molly, that something that may have come, may not be grown in upstate New York, but may have to be imported from a bit of a distance, may be better for you and, the, and your environment and their environment. I want to know, is it really from Fiji? <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> That's what, no, I know. I, and it's, actually, the most, it's the craziest thing I've ever This gets back to the whole foods issue, I think, because actually we count a lot. And, and when you, I do a lot of work with companies that are really committed to using um, what buying power they have to um, at least be aware, as honestly and transparently as they can be, about the consequences of choices they make. And so it really boils down to um, a food system with integrity. And I think that's really a very important lesson from the rise of organic agriculture in the United States. Um, at the time the organic movement got started, um, I think there was very little um, expectation in, um, in any of the in any quadrants that this could um, grow the way it has and I can say for most of my career organic agriculture has been growing in the double digits per year now does it really if you know about compound interest that gets serious pretty fast and actually it punches way above its weight in terms of influence I can tell you as a scientist I learned to think about systems from working with organic agriculture I also learned that soil it, now, in this century, is like space in the 1960s. It is the most exciting place. <laughs> and that's another really important lesson we learned from organic agriculture. And yet, organic agriculture has codified itself in a set of practices that themselves don't evolve. And so some of my close friends in the organic community find this rigidity, which was necessary in some sense to define and protect integrity, now restricting um, the, the ability to continue to evolve in a system that is pledged to healthy soils, healthy farms, healthy food, healthy people who eat the food. Raj, when you look at the situation, that, like you, were, you described NAFTA and corn, and there, in it, there's dozens of examples, other than reading your books or but, uh, attending exhibits like this, becoming educated, but how, how can people elect the politicians Support the policy, you know, demand the things that they, they, they that are right. When the, even among experts like you, there's not total agreement about what is a sustainable, what is the proper way to go. Well, I mean, I, I think the, I mean, looking to Washington for change, particularly around agriculture, is futile at the moment. Um, and uh, you know, people who who invest their invest their lives in trying to make Washington uh, you know, to make politicians there understand that the farm bill is a catastrophe um, are sad people. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, but, but that's a bit harsh. Right? <laughs> well, they're they're unhappy. Uh, and, 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 but whereas, I mean, for, for me, I, th I think one of the things that's interesting and important about political change around the food system is that actually there's quite a lot of it happening at a regional and a municipal level. Uh, and so there are things like food policy councils, which bring together um, you know, chefs and uh, uh, you know, people working in schools and people uh, who are sort of uh, uh, anti-poverty advocates uh, and local you know, small businesses and uh, labor, for, you know, because often, often with the locavore conversation, you know, the people who have forgotten other people who are actually working and, and uh, you know, who, who are on minimum wage. So you have a, a, an amazing coalition at these food policy councils 
uh, of citizens working together with their, with their you know, local elected officials to be able to make transformation in their own communities to end hunger and to eat more regionally and to, to have you know, a, a much more sustainable approach to the food system. Uh, and I, I think that, that that is a very promising kind of trickle-up approach to transformation in the food system and much more viable, I think, in, in terms of movement building for long-term change than supplicating to uh, politicians who've already been bought and paid for by uh, you know, the various corporate interests that, that are interested in the farm bill remaining the way it is. Well, let's get no, this is very in terms of the politicians yeah. uh, and what what matters. We want to talk. One of the major things is something that you mentioned earlier is how much does the these how much do the issues threaten us as Americans in this country? We can be very uh, provincial about this. How much does it threaten our our security as a nation politically from warfare? I mean, war. Starvation has been a weapon of war since there's been war. It's probably been since there's been people. And how much does it, and, and then that gets us, gets us into climate change. But how much is our security as a nation threatened from the food standpoint by these issues if they're not addressed? Well, maybe I can speak to that, having um, been involved on a drafting team for um, a report that was just issued last month. The president has a council of advisors in science and technology, a small, very elite group of scientists. Um, who, who, for the first time in my career, first time that I can remember anyway, issued a report last month on agricultural preparedness in this country and our exposure to those sorts of risks around the world. And the bottom line conclusion is that we are not prepared for a future that we can imagine. Uh, that's the, the likely future. We are not prepared. We've not invested in the types of research and innovation aimed at healthy people and healthy planet. We, in fact, in some ways, have not even failed to conceive of the right frame for what that future looks like. Um, I had the opportunity to represent the United States uh, or to, to be a United States commissioner on a 13-member on a, um, team that put together some policy recommendations. And we found a concept very powerful of safe operating space. What is it for this planet and our species. What is that going to look like? What is a safe operating space where human beings um, have enough to survive appropriately within planetary limits? I can tell you we don't really know even what the names of those planetary limits are and I would argue that we don't know how to describe the human condition we desire. Well is it worse than climate change? As it, is, is food less understood the climate change and climate change is well understood and nothing is being there's done a, about it. There's I, a total nexus there. They interact. <coughs> our future, sorry Marcus, our future uh -huh. with respect to food is, is very dependent on, on climate obviously and I can tell you in the Midwest our growing season in Wisconsin has shifted about a month already in the last 50 years. So from the science community's point of view we're 50 years into significant change and we are already adapting. Um, the, the issue isn't do we understand it or not. I'm watching people who are exposed to that risk manage it because that's good business. So I would say we can debate about whether we understand climate change, but we're in the middle of it and reacting. And I think, again, setting our targets for healthy people, individ individual health and collective health is a critically important attribute of what safe space is going to look like. I, I think that... Um, any movement takes a long time, whether it's uh, whatever change, whether it's gay rights, women's rights, civil rights, movement takes a long, long time. And uh, f we're a very young country and our dealing with food um, is, is, is uh, in, in media and on a nationwide conversation is also very young. You know, it wasn't until like in I think 97 New York Times committed every Wednesday to have a food issue. I think their sports issue was probably committed somewhere like in the, I don't know, in the 30s and the 40s. You know, so think about that. And then you go from every Wednesday to, n it wasn't really until like three or four years ago that Mark Bittman started to consistently write op-eds, right? Not just, hey, I'm writing about restaurants or new trends, right. like, and then Frank Bruner every now and then writes something, and then, you know, Michael Paul, and so on. So, so, and, and they're now getting more and more ink, and now they're committing to uh, food issues and so on. 
But uh, I think there's one food issue every year in the New York Times. Well, there's six fashion issues every year in the magazines. <laughs> so you think about everyone in this country knows when the Super Bowl is, uh, and I would argue that everyone in Ethiopia knows when Lent breaks <laughs> and what you're going to eat. So our, our response, where we put food in our society and how it relates to uh, our environment <laughs> is still very, 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 very low. Well, speaking so of until we put it for a higher priority level, yeah. then so it's not until we actually, it's very important, it's very sad that all these uh, illness and s diabetes and allergies and, and, and obesity is happening. The good thing with this is that it happens to wealthy kids too and wealthy families too, and now it's forced to be on the front page of conversation. We're, we're behind, but we're doing a good job catching up and eventually hopefully getting on the right side of that. Well, didn't we come into the situation very suddenly because for the most part, even the United States and Europe coming out of World War II, the, the issue for everybody was just having enough to eat and it was for in, most of, in most of the world. And if you look back, we've all seen this in, in pictures of uh, stories about obesity, the, the sandwich portions that were served in, in uh, five and 10 cents stores and everything else we're, we're, we're minuscule, and then suddenly we have these enormous portions, and, and portions became, became everything. Are, are we dealing with a tsunami that came on so quickly that, not that it's not important, it, it, it's enormously important, but does it come on faster maybe than our uh, capability to understand it? Not our capability to understand it, I think. I mean, uh, we, we can trace from the 1970s um, when uh, American waistlines began to uh, expand, uh, and we can we, we can couple that to changes in uh, commodity policies, the rise of high fructose corn syrup, and a range of other things. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think actually the, the 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 good news is we kind of know what to do. Uh, but, but there's you know we we, we know that, that things like um, you know, restricting portion size, or, you know, restricting marketing, for example, and go Mayor Bloomberg. These kinds of interventions are important, but we also do need these bigger systemic changes. Um, and I think the cultural changes as well. I, I think that sure. that's, that's sort, of, sort of, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you in, the, in thinking that you know, one of the tragedies of the industrial food system is that we forget where we are in terms of where our food comes from and also when we are. Uh, and if, if, we're, if we're without time or place in our food, I think we've lost a great deal. It's um, my nephew that goes to school in a simple public school in Sweden. The email that I know my sister will get tomorrow from the school will be next week's menu to the simple public school in Gothenburg with much lower economy. If, you know, Sweden uh, doing okay. Uh, will be probably one of the poorest states if you think about economy-wise in America, but. She will get an email spelling out what next week's menu is at their local public school. So if her um, son has an allergy or a religious or spiritual belief or anything, they know that on Wednesday they can have this or X, Y, and Z. Uh, we have more computers in America than we have in Sweden. Email works in both places. <laughs> um, we have the systems. And, and do you, even to offer that idea, that people would be, and, and America would be great to offer that idea because it's a much more diverse country. So there's much, much many more kids with spiritual uh, beliefs to not be able to eat what, whatever is in the public schools, but we have not invested the resources in it. And even to come with that idea, uh, I think someone would say, why would you do that? So I think that we, we're, we're very often committed to like, the US is number one. And if you don't say the US is number one, you're not patriotic. Well, I think it's very patriotic to challenge it. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and why is that important? But what did I learn in eating in public schools in Sweden? Uh, I learned taste. I had to eat bitter stuff, not what I liked. I had to eat Yeah, you grew vegetables. up in Sweden and yeah. you didn't grow up in Sicily. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, and I had to eat bitter things like broccoli and, and if it was cod was served, I had to learn or not eat, right? And uh, my sense of taste, my shape of taste, was really shaped by what I ate in school from the age of six <coughs> to 16, and the exposure to real food. My options drinking with my lunch was water or milk. There was no soda. 
and my options of bread was crisp bread or rye bread. So my sense of sh uh, taste is completely different. And this happens all over the world. That's and and the fact that we, the wealthiest, are invested in something else and not that, uh, it's a failure, it's a complete failure. That's a great point. And I just want to remind, we're getting close to the card question time, so if anybody has questions, be sure to get, hand them to the, one of the monitors in the hallway. That's a great idea. I mean, I think there is some of that going on in, 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 in some schools in the United States as well. Yeah, but right? that's my point. It's like, it, 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 it should be a guarantee regardless where you live. The food chasm starts very early, and it almost every time connected to your finances. And I think it has to change. The food, we gotta break down the food chasm and, and, and the whole, the geography where good food should be in a town and where they should not be in another part of town. Uh, it, we're, we, it's worse off here than anywhere else because the food chasm is so large. So Raj just said, though, we know what to do. We also know what not to do. Telling people don't eat that because it's not good for you doesn't really work that well. And so I think we have some, um, we have some evidence of what, n what doesn't work, and yet we continue to do that at scale as if it's somehow going to fix things, and it's obviously not. So I think we've made some choices both by not doing things we know will work and continuing to do things that just don't work. And there are reasons why um, sure. we maintain those strategies, even though we know they don't work. Well, we, it took 40 years in this country to get rid of, to get tobacco consumption cut in half. Absolutely. And, and that's, so it, it's, these are not, not simple matters. You know, it, it, took, it didn't take the cigarette industry nearly that long to get everybody addicted and it was part of the culture for a long time. But, so we, we hear the idea about, you were talking about co-ops in, in areas, uh, people putting pressure on their local politicians. Molly, give me a specific thing that you'd like to see it at the local or semi-local level other than writing a letter to the, your, the con person in Congress who Raj has already told, told us is foolish and, and owned by the farm lobby. Well, one of the most exciting things I watch happening at a local level is the recognition of that we can move past some um, 20th century antagonisms um, between, for example, um, traditional or so-called conventional agriculture, which I can tell you in Wisconsin isn't that conventional, and environmental movements. Um, where, so in a very exciting thing I'm watching in the state of Wisconsin is agriculture within Farmgate owning the responsibility to maintain the resources upon which they depend and are their immediate surroundings with as much commitment as environmentalists. It started about 15 years ago with our potato growers who had a signature conservation species, a crane. And potato growers knew they could either conserve the crane themselves or get hammered for a lot of liabilities they weren't that excited about themselves. They banded together, they got really good quality partners, and, um, and have significantly improved the amount of pesticide they use, et cetera. They did that from inside the farm gate with help from those around and from industry. So I'm excited to see us moving beyond historic simple antagonisms like organic or not, or farming and agriculture, to more, um, more recognition we're in community, we're in well, this together. Well, let me together. ask you a question about that, and then anybody can answer, because I've, I've been on farms in the United States where these days, vegetable farms, uh, large ones, you know, they would, are owned by big firms, but what, they have to be obsessively worried about animals crossing their property because of the danger of the E. coli, and then if their food gets branded as having been uh, in fact, it can shut down and, and, and it can make a lot of people sick, obviously, but also can ruin their reputation. So they have a, a need to try to limit biodiversity by keeping these creatures out, uh, out of the land. How do you, is, is that one of the, that's not a non-reconcilable dilemma, right? Well, I think there's tension throughout any food system. And being honest about that is really important. Um, the tension between food safety and waste is huge. The safer your food, the more you're going to throw away. So realizing that there are trade-offs in food systems and that which scale you're looking at makes a big difference. This is one of the most um, important things the locavore movement has um, forced us to understand is that just because I can think and work in this space doesn't mean I'm not nested in larger conversations, whether I like it or not, whether I choose to acknowledge that or not. Um, and so there is always tension and there are always trade-offs. 
And, and we are really hoping from the science community to flip into leveraging more about what we know about complexity and uncertainty and systems um, towards food systems that work better for the planet and for the people, for individuals and for communities, respecting the fact that food is complicated. Well, and we all so, what, Raj, when, when the food co-op in Park Slope has an argument, which they have almost every hour, <laughs> okay, uh, which is how, where, where do they go to get information that you would say is reliable about what they should put on their shelves? This is a place that's, I'm sure you all know it, but it's a place where they're trying to do the right thing. It's, it is a, it's a genuine co-op. They're trying to sell food that, that's healthy and ethically worldwide responsible and sustainable. I, I mean, I think, first of all, the fact that co-ops have arguments is an incredibly good sign because otherwise they're not working it. You know, I mean, argument is the, the, the meat and potatoes of democracy. And uh, if you don't have an argument, then you've just got a tyranny and, and a sort of nodding majority. So I, I think it's a good thing that there are arguments about these things. But I mean, I don't think that there is a, a, a food police. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, I think one of, one of the worrying things about the, the whole food story is that your, your entire sort of knowledge of the world and your social interactions are reduced to a label the size of a postage stamp. You know, when, when all you're relying on is the USDA certification, uh, then you, the, the social interactions that bond you to the people who are uh, growing the food and working on the land and the land itself, all of that gets tossed out of the window and instead you just have the rubber stamp. So the, the, I, I don't think that there's a single place one can or should go. I think that, that actually the, 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 a sort of diversified network of knowledge is how farming systems work a, around the world. And I think that that's actually a, a good way of knowing the world and knowing our food in the 21st century. So, I, I mean, when, the, when Park Slope argue about, well, is this ethical or not, a good way to, to settle the issue is to go to, to the people who, you know, it, who's, uh, w w go to the source of that ethical quandary and ask them, uh, because that's a much better way than, than us sort of certifying, yes, it's ethical or no, it isn't. But couldn't something that's ethical in one part of the food chain be unethical in another part? And sure. that gets to be yeah. really That's the tension. Sure. And, and to Raja's point, transparency about that, honesty about that, sure. is real progress. I mean, we and learn that with seafood all the time, right? You can mm -hmm. go on the website and you can figure out what, you know, is, is it, is it farm-raised cod or is it wild cod? In one place it's ethical, in one place it's not, you know? So we learned that. And the interesting thing is in, in, in Scandinavia still, um, the community there is very familiar with this. This is a public <laughs> conversation. Mm -hmm. And through, you know, so an average family checks this out. It's like, okay, right now, um, prawns are not, uh, something, especially prawns from, let's say, Thailand. It's not ethical. Okay, so no one in Sweden, Sweden buys it, and don't you dare have it in restaurants. <laughs> you know, so it's a very transparent conversation about it. And, and I'm sure that's, that provides a lot of issue for the, for the, for the prawn <coughs> fishermen in Thailand. But, you know, it, it, it's these, you know, what's right in one part of the world is completely wrong in another part of the world. Should I take the cards yet? Yeah, bit, yeah. I'm just for the organizers <laughs> yes, to say. Not that I've run out of questions because this is utterly <laughs> fascinating. But the, uh, <laughs> what is the word, and I, I want each of you to say, tell me this. What does the word sustainability mean? Because we hear that all the time. What in the world does sustainability mean? I'll start with you, Raj. Well, I mean, I think it's the, the democratic process by which we. Uh, live our lives today so that people in the future can live their lives as well as we can. Um, and that means, you know, th th that involves a, a constraint on, on the amount that we consume now so that you know, we stint so that people in the future can, can have barely enough you know, to, 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 to survive. Um, but I, I think sustainability is about a process not of, of understanding our ecological limits, limits but also the, the process democratically by which we um, rein ourselves in in the, rich, in the rich world so that people in the poor world can survive. So actually that, that's the definition I use, but I'll, I'll point one um, feature out that's really important. Right now, um, the state of the art in, um, in food and food systems for sustainability is called continuous improvement. It's the idea that whatever it is now will make it a little bit better, incremental improvement. Well, for any of us who've worked in landscapes, that's a tough concept to, to transport from an industrial <laughs> setting. And so um, flipping that to reflect exactly what Marcus said, which is to move beyond what's good and bad, to demonify or celebrate one thing as if it's the answer across all mm -hmm. scales and for all mm -hmm. people, moving beyond that is going to be a critical part of understanding what sustainability is because sustainability connects us sideways 
and forward in time. And it means in a fundamental sense, recognizing when we're working in extractive modes, in ways that use things up so they're not there later, and innovating where necessary. And I suggest there's a lot of opportunity um, to innovate, in other words, great need, towards um, cycles that care better for the resources we depend on and for ourselves, for ourselves individually and for um, our, our human family. Sustainability for me on a local level, it could be globally, it could be nationwide and so on, um, is really to keep uh, the DJ coming back to the farmer's market in Harlem. Uh, because he was really, when we did a farmer's market and no one showed up and it was not culturally right, and then we put a DJ on the farmer's market and it got packed. Right. And it, it's almost like a joke, but it's not because it made right. it culturally relevant. And then sustainability for me also means making an affordable and cultural relevant farmer's market. Um, and maybe then create a co-op system through what I think about as farmer's bodega. Since you've got to recognize, we can think about all these large ideas, but you got to also bring it down to a very local level in communities that are not having. If the farmer's market in Union Square gets a little bit better, versus having a farmer's market in Harlem, mm -hmm. I'd rather take that, right? Yeah. And but they, then, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, no, they're not, but, but they're, you're, you're, you're gain on making a farmer's market part-time that doesn't have, have one, and then connecting it to actually how do I interact and how do I make it culturally right, and how, make it, how do I make that affordable, and how can I then create a system so the bodegas, which you gotta recognize that so many people still buy their fruits from, can then, work with the farmer's market, so you have farmer's bodega. That is sustainability, what it looks like in urban America. If it's not affordable, if it's not culturally relevant, it's just stuff that is for one part of town and not for the other. You know, I had a colleague in the Menominee Nation who said, quite simply, we need to learn to live within our means. Indeed. <laughs> Excuse me for having to put on my glasses uh, to read, and I can't read some of these people's handwriting, but I'm going to try my best. If, uh, if problem is distribution of food, can't vertical family systems uh, throughout the city uh, remove the problem of distribution and allow continuous delivery of fresh food? I, I don't, I mean, I, I, th th this vertical farming idea, I think, is, you know, the sort of, uh, and th th there's, a, there's a, a model of it in the exhibit, um, of this sort of geodesic dome with a, a swirl, and I, I, is it a Swedish model? D yeah. It is, right? Uh, did you know about this? I mean, it, it's, I mean, it, the, the problem in, in uh, uh, American cities, for example, where there is hunger, is not an insufficiency of geodesic domes with little swirls in them. Uh, that, that is not the reason why exactly. people are going hungry. <laughs> um, the, the, the reason is it, it's an issue of poverty, and uh, so, and in fact, that's been the alibi for cheap food, right? I mean, if if people are poor in America, surely the solution is one dollar hamburgers, uh, and th th that's been you know that's the warmatization of the problem of hunger, uh, where uh, you know the, the problem, uh, and and the first lady sadly is you know it's awkward to say this, but the the first lady is sort of backing the idea that what you need is more Walmart um, with its low wage work and you know more food stamps. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, that vertical farms don't solve the problem of poverty. What we need is not for, uh, for food to be cheaper, but for, for wages to be higher so that everyone can afford to eat properly. But I can say there are, and I think probably many of us in the room know, have seen stunning examples of the potential for urban agriculture. I can say in the city of Milwaukee, the city of Detroit, the city of Chicago, the, the restoration of, um, of food sovereignty locally in communities is so important and powerful where it works well. And, and the transmission, there's a fabulous high school in Chicago, Chicago's High School for Ag Sciences, 80 acres of food production around a high school that is now a vibrant, amazing place to visit. It wasn't that way 25 years ago. So I, I think that, uh, you know, really to echo um, comments that have been made throughout the panel, where we make moves that provision ourselves better for food, we're probably taking good care of other aspects of what it means to be human and healthy. We, we, we shifted. I, I don't think necessarily food and, uh, and poverty, good food and poverty is necessarily linked. 
I think it's the choices that we allowed in, and it goes with other junk decisions that we allowed in. And you know, it's it's when I look at poverty in Africa, you have no access to good water, but you eat terrific. You eat chickpeas, you eat fresh vegetables, you eat great. When I look at poverty in America, you have cable TV and great water, but you have a lot of junk in those communities, so the choices. So, so we've sort of allowed, when I look at, before I opened Rooster, I looked at a lot of images of, Red Roos, oh, of Harlem from 20s, 30s, 40s. The farmer's market was thriving during the Second World War. There was, every business had food stand outside. So there was definitely a lot of sign of great food. There was no junk food, but there was great food and people cooked. So we've allowed in, so our bar, are we gonna say what's allowed in certain communities versus in other communities are lower. So it's not necessarily for me a linkage to what you can afford, it's just, it, it's really how is marketing in those communities towards junk experience uh, and then we also have a generation of lost cooks. So we stop, cook, stop cooking, which is key. It's key, key, key. Well, how do you as a chef deal with that? Because that is a, is a critical problem. The Amer sure. A lot of Americans don't, uh, and particularly ones even with means or without, because fast food exists for those without means, as you said, the dollar hamburger. It, it just people don't, don't cook at home of any income level like they used to. And, and how do you, as somebody who runs a restaurant, try to encourage people to do their own cooking? Well, uh, first of all, I don't break it down as simple as I run a restaurant. I, I think about, uh, okay, what is truly my responsibility? Uh, and how do I meet many people who I communicate with? And, and we communicate, you know, online basically to 750,000 people every month. And so we have an opportunity to communicate with good content and communicate out what we believe in, whether it's Meatless Monday or whether it's portion size. Mm -hmm. And we constantly use old values with new, you know, like with social media to communicate out what we believe in, slowly shifting the conversation, right? And then, obviously, what is that restaurant in my, in my community? What does it really mean? Uh, well, the restaurant gives aspirations to a part of town that has forgotten its food aspirations. It, it, it seats, um, we, s we have probably about six, 700 people on average coming every day. Uh, we have 140 employees that are all locally, well not all locally, but 70% of them are locally. So it changes uh, basically in an area where we have 18.7% unemployment. So we have an importance in that. And then the guy who washes the windows and the guys who sells us the flowers are also as community. So, it's not so much about the role of a chef for me, if I would just think about it, how can I get busy and how can I just sell seats in my I restaurant? I want to follow up on your point with... with, with but that is really how I think about it. I use the opportunity right. and the platform to communicate in and shift the conversation that I would like to have in terms of food. Well, Marcus is obviously doing a good <coughs> example of how it should be done, but there's this fascination with food, the Food Network. People watch Marcus and, uh, and other celebrity chefs cooking all day long. How, what, how does that relate to either a new awareness that we want to do things right, or just that I'm really hungry and I want something that tastes good? Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I think the work Marcus is doing is, is vital and, and tremendously important. I think the Food Network is, I mean, it could go either way. Fred Kaufman wrote a book called uh, History of the American Stomach in which he compared uh, the, you know, the, 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 the kinds of shots uh, that they used in the Food Network to pornography. Uh, and, 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 found, and, and you know, of course, the, the majority of people who, who watch the Food Network don't cook. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's there purely for, for entertainment value. But I do think that there are, um, you know, that there, there is obviously a sort of food movement in the United States. And I think there are really important and, and, and uh, you know, successful examples of uh, people's <coughs> attitudes to cooking being transformed. So, for example, I'm connected to the Edible Schoolyard. Um, uh, which was set up, set up by uh, Alice Waters and, and uh, now is in a number of schools throughout the country. Uh, but you know, what happens there is not a, a sort of pornographic view of food, but actually you know, kids 
growing the food and then cooking it together and then eating together. And all of these are lost skills, right? And, you know, so, so in Berkeley, you know, the kids get around the table, they have little conversation starter cards because they've often not had these conversations. So it's, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or why is there racism in the world? You know, it's a <laughs> Berkeley conversation starter yeah. card. <laughs> and, um, and Upper, upper West Side, so, please give us our due. But, but I think that the, these, these skills actually can be taught and they, 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 they are successful. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want, I don't want my, I don't want to be parent, I don't want my, my, my kid to be parented by the Food Network. I, 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 I think that there are plenty of opportunities to do that in a school, which is you know, where, where kids often learn, uh, though not always. And, uh, and, I, and I think, I, I think that, the, 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 that there are, you know, that we do have some examples of really vibrant uh, sort of ways of, of pushing back. And some exciting examples that work, but I'll tell you that school in Chicago I told you about, there's about one of them like that. And I would like the next Farm Bill to have a high school like that in every city. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets back to the farm bill, which we've already heard about. So, but let me ask another question from the audience. Uh, how do you expect poor families to be able to produce, uh, buy fresh produce and non-processed food when fast food remains so much cheaper and convenient, especially with more households having less time with both parents working? We've discussed some of these issues, but you know, how do you bring that change to a community other than opening a restaurant and doing but, the but out outreach and No, but, but A, get back to cooking and dining together and making sure and putting a premium on, on dining and cooking versus putting a premium on Xbox. It's like shifting the premium here because uh, first of all, if you cook and you know how to cook, it's cheaper than uh, a fast food dinner. It is, because if you buy roasted chicken and, and if you eat it uh, one day and you do chicken soup the second day and you do fried rice with chicken the third day, you will beat everything. Plus, you, you can control what goes in there. So it's going back to understanding and also talking about, well, today, that fried rice with chicken might, have, it might be vegetable-based the third day. Well, it's fresh and, and, and so on. So going back and understanding how, how to cook and then also understanding the, the value of, of the meal is not just what I put into no, my No, but the, the question from the audience is, 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 has to do with how you put the pressure, and I don't mean pressure in a bad way, but how do you in, change attitudes in a community where people are often struggling and, and they see the dollar Big Mac on the corner and it's just so yeah, much easier. Yeah, but it's, co it's cooking. So I can expla explain, for example, for any, I can challenge anybody here that we can have a gourmet meal with $10, right, for four people. You can buy, let's say, ramen noodles, fresh vegetables, and two chicken breasts, and that gives you about a four-ounce piece of protein, fresh vegetables, and ramen, and you have a delicious meal, right? Then we go out and say, okay, we're all gonna go and eat a uh, hamburger for people. That's not gonna go under 10 bucks. All right, uh, nobody would disagree with what, what Or that couscous, is. for example. Yeah, but the question, the question is, how do we get attitudes toward what you're trying to push? Well, I don't think that's a poor person. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's econo economy related. I have a lot of people of, uh, from Latin communities that work with me, and they cook every day, and, and uh, so I don't, I, or African-American families, I do not think it's necessarily linked to uh, economy. It happens in rich communities too. But I think there yeah. is, there's an opportunity, I can say, you know, as raising a large family in a rural culture that where our family feels much, probably pretty, pretty old fashioned, each of our kids took dinner a different night. And I admit we ate a lot of, you know, each kid had a fixed menu, but it was a balanced menu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we ate a lot of the same thing. But each kid learned how to cook and, and um, I think that sort of simple thing, we ate together, they learned how to cook, somebody else had to clean up, so that uh, created some tension. But <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> the no, but not just with poor, but not just, I agree, it's definitely not just with poor p families, but there's so many families where the kid is plunked down in front of the television set and, 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 and the food comes in in some outside form. <laughs> and we all here would agree that that's wrong. The question is how do you change it? I think, you know, one very exciting thing for me to see is what, um, as an educator, I connect to schools. When there is a move in a school, as Marcus just said, he developed tastes in school. Um, there is a lot of focus now on what is, on both school nutrition, but also what's, what's communicated in school about food. And beyond the bag of chemicals you put in your mouth, um, what is what are our options? What's the meaning of it? And I can tell you, I've seen so many exciting things happening in schools all across the, the country, starting 
maybe not starting with Alice Waters, yeah. but um, there are just a host of really thrilling things to see. And do you think maybe it'll take a generation like that where we start working? I, with kids? I think there's a lot of well, changes. I, we do, for the last three years, two and a half years, we've been committed uh, to do one cooking class for free every month in, within my company. So I mean a lot of kids for kids. Public, private, charter, anybody. If you're up in Manhattan, you have access to it. We're going to get to you. So I meet a lot of different kids. And, um, you know, I have one example. I did something at the YMCA, 135th Street. I bring this example up all the time. He said, he asked me, I need a grilled chicken with couscous, and I put um, um, a cheese into it. And he asked, he raised his hand, 13-year-old kid, inner city kid. He asked me, chef, is that feta cheese you're putting in? <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, it is. How do you know that? He said, Food Network, <laughs> right? And I've done, one time I did the state dinner in my home for kids. So the kids had to cook it. Same dinner as we did the state dinner. Uh, it was vegetarian based. And the kids cooked it. And they had to write a menu and so on. And there was a 10 year old, ten, bunch of 10 year olds. And some, most of the, those kids, they knew how to cook. And it was almost, they almost knew how to cook too well. I was like, how do you know how to cook this well? I'm taking care of my sisters and brothers, 10 years old. I did the same cooking class a couple of weeks ago for private uh, uh, kids. What's your favorite food? Nobu. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know? Have you ever helped your mom to cook? No, we order in. So the, the notion of poor, mm -mm. who's poor? But, but, I mean, I, I <laughs> change it, change it. I mean, I, I, I see that there's a cultural component here, but it's also, you know, if, if you're earning $2.13 an hour, which is the minimum wage for uh, workers who are um, working for tips, for example, um, and you're trying to afford an apartment, and you're, you know, you're, you're up against some, fail, some sure. tough constraints in terms of what you can afford to eat. Um, and that's why I, mean, I, I think that there are some, you know, I, mean, I think the cultural shift is important. That's why I like slow food, for example. I mean, slow food in the United States has its reputation sure. as a kind of circle jerk of olive oil fanciers and <laughs> red wine fetishists. But, but, but actually, the, 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 you know, the, their origin was around uh, labor organizing, because what yeah. they wanted was uh, for workers, the poorest workers, to be able to have, to address this problem of, uh, of making sure that everyone had t time and money to eat. And that's it. You need time and you need money. So they organized, they unionized agricultural workers, so the wages went up, and they organized for a two hour lunch break so people could actually have the time to cook and to be able to enjoy that food. And I think that, th you know, if, if we're interested and serious about, you know, uh, addressing issues around inequality and poverty, we absolutely need higher wages and more time for people to be able to cook and to, to be able to enjoy food. Also, I would suggest land reform. I mean, we need access to be able for, to green space for, to, for people to be able to farm. We're, we're done, almost. It's been utterly fascinating. We're not completely done. So, uh, but for the last, last question I want to ask you, <coughs> lightning round, very quick, a few sentences. Your advice to everybody who's been kind enough to come here, other than Bon Appetit. Um, get involved in food activism. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, shopping smart is good, but uh, I think that the way we, we transform the food system is uh, through <laughs> political political change. And uh, and the, the the joy of food is that you get to have political change and eat you know and and, and eat your cake too. <laughs> Let's figure out what it means to learn to live within our means. Do a family cookbook uh, and trace the family, your family, and, and connect your family through your grandparents and your, to, to your kids today and teach them about the roots of you, what you ate and spread it. If Facebook come up with one thing, spread your family cookbook. Mm -hmm. You know, I think because we will learn so much you learn so much of what connects you, what's different, and uh, I think it's a rich gift that you can, uh, will always be unique and interesting, and your family will learn a lot of things about yourself that you may or may not think about, have thought about. A wonderful piece of advice to end this on. I want to thank the three panelists for a phenomenal <laughs> evening. Thank you all for coming. Good night.